بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا وقعت الواقعة ليس لوقعتها كاذبة غافظة الرافعة إذا رجت الأرض رجا وبست الجبال بسا فكانت هباء منبثا وكنتم أزواجا ثلاثة فأصحاب الميمنة ما أصحاب الميمنة وأصحاب المشأمة ما أصحاب المشأمة والسابقون السابقون أولئك المقربون في جنات النعيم ثلة من الأولين وقليل من الآخرين على سرر موضونة متكئين عليها متقابلين يطوف عليهم ولدان مخلدون بأكوابه وأباريق وكأس من معين لا يصدعون عنها ولا ينزفون وفاكهة مما يتخيرون ولحم طير مما يشتهون وحور عين كأمثال اللؤلؤ المكنون جزاء بما كانوا يعملون لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا تأثيما إلا قيلا سلاما سلاما وأصحاب اليمين ما أصحاب اليمين في سدر مخضود وطلح منضود وذل ممدود وماء مسكوب وفاكهة كثيرة لا مقطوعة ولا ممنوعة وفرش مرفوعة إنا أنشأناهن إن شاء فجعلناهن أبكارا عربا أترابا لأصحاب اليمين ثلة من الأولين وثلة من الآخرين وأصحاب الشمال ما أصحاب الشمال في سموم وحميم وظل من يحموم لا بارد ولا كريم إنهم كانوا قبل ذلك مترفين وكانوا يسرون على الحنث العظيم وكانوا يقولون أئذا متنا وكنا ترابا وعظاما أئنا لمبعوثون أو آباؤنا الأولون قل إن الأولين والآخرين لمجموعون إلى ميقات يوم معلوم ثم إنكم أيها الضالون المكذبون لآكلون من شجر من زقوم فمالئون منها البطون فشاربون عليه من الحميم فشاربون شرب الهيم هذا نزلهم يوم الدين نحن خلقناكم فلولا تصدقون أفرأيتم ما تمنون أأنتم تخلقونه أم نحن الخالقون 
نحن قدرنا بينكم الموت وما نحن بمسبوقين على أن نبدل أمثالكم وننشئكم فيما لا تعلمون ولقد علمتم النشأة الأولى فلولا تذكرون أفرأيتم ما تحرثون أأنتم تزرعونه أم نحن الزارعون لو نشاء لجعلناه حطاما فظلتم تفكرون إنا لمغرمون بل نحر محرومون أفرأيتم الماء الذي تشربون أأنتم أنزلتموه من المزن أم نحن المنزلون لو نشاء جعلناه أجاجا فلولا تشكرون أفرأيتم النار التي تورون أأنتم أنشأتم شجرتها أم نحن المنشئون نحن جعلناها تذكرة ومتاعا للمقوين فسبح باسم ربك العظيم فلا أقسم بمواقع النجوم وإنه لقسم لو تعلمون عظيم إنه لقرآن كريم في كتاب مكنون لا يمسه إلا المطهرون تنزيل من رب العالمين أفبهذا الحديث أنتم مدهنون وتجعل رزقكم أنكم تكذبون فلولا إذا بلغت الحلقوم وأنتم حينئذ تنظرون ونحن أقرب إليه منكم ولكن لا تبصرون فلولا إن كنتم غير مدينين ترجعونها إن كنتم صادقين فأما إن كان من المقرب بين فرح وريحان وجنة نعيم وأما إن كان من أصحاب اليمين فسلام لك من أصحاب اليمين وأما إن كان من المكذبين الضالين فنزل من حميم وتصلية جحيم إن هذا له حق اليقين فسبح باسم ربك العظيم اللهم سن هجوهنا باليسار ولا تهنا بالقدار فنسترزك طالب رزقك ونستعطف شرار خنكك ونشتغل بحمل من عطايا ونبتلى بذم من معنا وانت من وراء ذلك كله اهل العطاء والمنع اللهم كما وصلت وجوهنا عن السجود الا لك فسنا عن الحاجه الا اليك بجودك وقربك وفضلك يا ارحم الراحمين يا ارحم الراحمين يا ارحم الراحمين اغننا بفضلك عمن سواك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وهب لنا به صلى الله عليه واله وسلم من رزق الحلال الطيب المبارك ما تصون به وجوهنا عن التعرض لا أحد من خلقك واجعل اللهم لنا إلي طريقا سهلا من غير فتنة ولا محنة ولا منة ولا تبعة لأحد وجنبنا الله من الحرام حيث كان وأين كان وعند من كان وحل بيننا وبين أهلك وقبض عنا أيديهم واصرف عنا هجوهم وقلوبهم حتى لا نتقلب إلا فيما يرضيك ونستتعين بنعمتك إلا فيما تحبه وترضى برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إن كان رزقنا في السماء فأنزل وإن كان في الأرض فأخرج وإن كان معسرا فيسر وإن كان بعيدا فقرب وإن كان حراما فطهر وإن كان قليلا فكثر وإن كان معدوما فأوجد وإن كان موقوفا فأجره وإن كان ذنبا فاغفره وإن كان سيئة فامحها وإن كان خطيئة فتجاوز عنها وإن كان عثرة فوكنها وبارك لنا في جميع ذلك إنك مليك مقتدر وما تشاء من أمر يكون يا من إذا أراد شيئا إنما يقول له كن فيكون سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم يا الله يا علي يا عظيم يا حليم يا عليم أنت ربي وعلمك حسبي فنعم الرب ربي ونعم الحسب حسبي تنصر من تشاء وأنت العزيز الرحيم نسألك بالعسمة في الحركات والسكنات والكلمات والإرادات والخطرات من الشقوق والظنون والأوهام الساتر للقلوب عن مطالعة الغيوب فقد ابتلي المؤمنون وزلزلوا زلزالا شديدا وإذ يقول المنافقون والذين في قلوبهم مرض ما وعدنا الله ورسوله إلا غرورا فثبتنا وانصرنا وسخر لنا هذا البحر كما سخرت البحر لموسى وسخرت النار إبراهيم وسخرت الجبال والحديد لداود وسخرت الريح والشياطين والجن لسليمان وسخرت لنا كل بحر هو لك في الأرض والسماء والملك والملكوت وبحر الدنيا وبحر الآخرة وسخرت لنا كل شيء يا من بيده ملكوت كل شيء كاف ها يا عين صاد كاف ها يا عين صاد كاف ها يا عين صاد انصرنا فإنك خير الناصرين وافتح لنا فإنك خير الفاتحين واغفر لنا فإنك خير الغافلين وارحمنا فإنك خير الراحمين وارزقنا فإنك خير الرازقين واهدنا ونجنا من القوم الظالمين وهب لنا ريحا طيبة كما هي في علمك وانشرها علينا من خزائن رحمتك واحملها بها حمل الكرامة مع السلامة والعافة في الدين والدنيا والآخرة إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم يسر لنا أمورنا مع راحة لقلوبنا وأبداننا والسلامة والعافية في ديننا ودنيانا وكن لنا صاحبا في سفرنا وخليفة في أهلنا وطمس على هجوء أعدائنا وامسخهم على مكانتهم فلا يستطيعون المضي ولا مجيء إلينا ولو نشاء لطمسنا على أعين فاستبقوا الصراط فأنا يبصرون ولو نشاء لمسخناهم على مكانة فما استطاعوا مضيا ولا يرجعون ياسين والقرآن الحكيم إنك لمن المرسلين على صراط مستقيم تنزيل العزيز الرحيم لتنذر قوما ما أنذر آباؤهم فهم غافلون لقد حق القول على أكثرهم فهم لا يؤمنون إنا جعلنا في أعناقهم أغلالا فهي للإذقان فهم مقمحون وجعلنا من بين أيديهم سدا ومن خلفهم سدا فأشيناهم فهم لا يمصنون شاهت الهجوم شاهت الهجوم شاهت الهجوم وعنت الهجوه للحي القيوم وقد خاب من حمل ظلما طاسين حاميم عين سين قاف مرج البحرين يلتقيان بينهما برزخ لا يبغيان حاميم 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 حم الأمر وجاء النصر فعلينا لا ينصرون حاميم تنزل كتاب من الله العزيز العليم غافل الذم وقابل التوم شديد العقاب للطول لا إله إلا هو إليه المصير بسم الله بابنا تبارك حطاننا ياسين سقفنا كاف هيا عين صاك فايتنا حاميم عين سين قاف حمايتنا فسيكفيكهم الله السميع العليم ستر العرش مسبون علينا وعين الله ناظرة إلينا بحول الله لا يقدر علينا والله من ورائهم محيط من هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ فالله خير حافظ وهو أرحم الراحمين فالله خير حافظ وهو أرحم الراحمين فالله خير حافظ وهو أرحم الراحمين إن ولي الله الذي نزل الكتاب هو يتولى الصالحين حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو علي توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو علي توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو علي توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم 
بسم الله الذين يضطر مع اسم شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وهو السميع العليم بسم الله الذين يضطر مع اسم شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وهو السميع العليم بسم الله الذين يضطر مع اسم شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وهو السميع العليم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما تسليما الله لا اله الا هو الحي القيوم لا تاخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الارض من الذي يشفع عنده الا باذنه يعلم ما بين ايديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه الا بما شاء واسع كرسي السماوات والارض ولا يؤول حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم يا الله يا نون يا حق يا مبين اقسني من نورك وعلمني من علمك وافهمني منك واسمعني منك وبصرني بك واقمني بشهودك وعنفني الطريق اليك وهونها علي بفضلك والبسني لباس التقوى منك انك على كل شيء قدير يا سميع يا عليم يا حليم يا علي يا عظيم يا الله اسمع دعائي بخصائص نفك امين اعوذ بكلمات لا تامات كلها من شد ما خلق اعوذ بكلمات لا تامات كلها من شد ما خلق اعوذ بكلمات لا تامات كلها من شد ما خلق يا عظيم السلطان يا قديم الإحسان يا دائم النعمة يا باسط الرزق يا كثير الخيرات يا واسع العطاء يا دافع البلاء يا سامع الدعاء يا حاضر ليس بغائب يا موجود عند شدائد يا خفي اللطف يا لطيف سلع يا حليم لا يعجل اقض حاجتي برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنك تعلم ما نحن فيه وما نطلبه ونرتجي من رحمتك في أمننا كله فيسر لنا ما نحن فيه من سفرنا وما نطلبه من حوائجنا وقرب علينا المسافات وسلمنا من العلم والآفات ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم نشهد أن لا إله 
Taking from doubtful wealth that people possess. Uh, beware of going to extremes with yourself and saying, All the wealth of the world is unlawful, and the hands of people and their corrupt dealings have soiled it. Hence, I will either be content with living ascetically, or I will take hold of it all comprehensively without distinguishing between the lawful and unlawful. Rather know decisively let, that the lawful is clear and the unlawful is clear, and between them are affairs that are dubious. It was like that in the time of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and will be like that forever. So go forth from the secret that we have mentioned, for indeed you do not worship with what is in itself lawful, rather you worship with what you believe to be lawful. And do not know any of any apparent reason for its unlawfulness. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed ablution who do from the satchel of an idolatress. And Umar radiallahu an performed ablution from a Christian woman's jaw. If they were thirsty, they would have drank from each respectively. And drinking impure water is prohibited. However, they assumed its original state of certain purity and did not abandon the thought of it because of the mere notion of impurity. Likewise, in every form of wealth that you have acquired from the hand of a man whose state is unknown to you, you have the right to buy from him and eat the food he serves you as a way of having a good opinion of a Muslim. The basic principle is to assume that what he owns is lawful. As for what you acquire from a man from, from you know to be righteous, it is even more appropriate for you to believe that what he possesses is lawful. Of course, it is obligatory to be cautious of what you acquire from an oppressive sultan or a man whom you know deals in interest or selling alcohol. It is obligatory to be cautious of him until you ask, investigate, and come to know where he got his wealth from. If the manner in which he acquired it appears lawful to you, then you have the right to take it. If he does not, if he does not, then it is necessary to rely upon an external sign as the indication of his state. This is the majority of his wealth is unlawful. If the majority of it is lawful, then you have the right to eat from it. But if you leave it, that is caution. One of the agents of Ibn Mubarak once wrote to him from Basra, asking him about dealing with a man who had dealings with the Sultan. He said, if he does not deal with anyone but the Sultan, then do not deal with him. If he deals with other than him as well, then deal with him. Generally, 
people are six divisions in respect of you. The first of them is that the person is unknown. Eat from his wealth and caution is not obligatory. Rather, it is pure piety. The second is that you know a person to be righteous and good. Eat from his wealth without precaution. For precaution in his case is a baseless misgiving. If it leads to offensive or embarrassment, then it is an unlawful act of disobedience. Due to the offense it contains and because it involves holding a bad opinion of a righteous man. The third is that you know a person to be oppressive and one who deals with interest to the extent that you know that either all or the majority of his wealth is unlawful, like oppressive sultans and others, their wealth is unlawful. The fourth is that you know that the majority of a person's wealth is lawful. However, it is not completely free of the unlawful, like a man who has a business or some inheritance while at the same time works for the sultan. While you have the right to take from where the bulk of his wealth derives, it is important to leave it for the sake of precaution. The fifth is that a person is unknown to you, but you see about you see about him a sign that he is an oppressor, such as long sleeved outer garment, a fleshy bead covering, or posing like a Turk or an oppressive ruler. These outer signs necessitate caution. Do not eat from his wealth except after investigation. The sixth is that you see about a person the sign of sin rather than the sign of oppression, such as long mustache or partially shaved head, seeing him curse another or looking at an unrelated woman. If you know that he has some wealth that was inherited or from business, his wealth from that is not lawful. However, if his affair is unknown to you, then there must be some examination regarding this. For the sign of sin is weaker than the sign of oppression. Nevertheless, the most apparent ruling to me is that this wealth is not unlawful, because obvious possessions and Islam indicates ownership more clearly than these signs are an indication of unlawfulness. Neither is this indication stronger than the indication given by a person's Christianity or Zoroastrianism or impurity of his water and Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Umar radiallahu an did not give heed to it. As for the signs of the sign of oppression, it is like as if we saw a gazelle urinating in water and thereafter found that the water had changed. While it is possible for the change to have come from prolonged standing of the water or from the urine, it would be obligatory to avoid it in the view of obvious cause. In addition to all this, it is obligatory for a person to ask his heart if he finds in his heart any disturbance, then he should avoid it. For sin is the disturbance of the heart and the friction of the chest. There is, however, a subtlety that many pious people are heedless of. It is that whenever something is foregone out of precaution or a disturbed conscience, it is nevertheless not permissible to forego it or inquire about it if doing so would cause offense. Thus, if an unknown person serves you food and you ask him, where is this from? He would be embarrassed and offended, causing annoyance and having a bad opinion of others are both unlawful. If you ask someone else, but he knows that you asked, then offense is even greater. If you ask someone else about him without him knowing, then you have spied on him, held a bad opinion, and sometimes opinions is sinful, made light of backbiting and accused him without basis, all which is unlawful. On the other hand, leaving of precaution is not unlawful, so there is nothing you can do but show kindness by leaving it. 
If caution is not possible without offending him, then you must eat. Indeed, gladdening a Muslim's heart and protecting it from offense is more important than caution. Know that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ate from charity given to Barira and did not ask about the giver. Gifts used to be brought to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he accepted them without asking. Yes, when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first arrived in al Madina, he used to ask whether what was brought was a gift or charity because there is no offense in that and because the circumstantial evidence pointed to the equal likelihood of, of it being either charity or a gift. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to be invited to people's homes and he would accept without asking. Instances of him questioning have only been narrated really in cases of doubt. You may say, if there is unlawful food in a market, do I buy from that market? I say, if you have verified that the unlawful is the majority, then do not buy from it except after investigation. If you know that the unlawful is abundant but not the majority, then you have the right to buy and should investigate as a precaution. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions radiallahu an used to shop in various markets during their travels, knowing that there were people who dealt in interest and stole and people who unlawfully took booty, yet they did not refrain from dealing with them. This subject calls for a long explanation. If you desire that, then read the book of permissible and the prohibited from the revival. On reading it, you will see that with respect to its verification, conveyance and comprehensive detail, nothing of its kind had been written. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. That's Imam Ghazali rahimahullah, speaking about Allah's favor upon him in the compilation of his Ihya. I've seen many praises of the Ihya from various ulama, scholars, especially our Mashaykh in Hadramaut. They adopted the Ihya as, a, as their primary text in Tasawwuf. And many of them would have studied the Ihya several times over. Such that the Sheikh of our Sheikh, Habib Abdul Qadir bin Ahmad al Saqaf, he um, uh, said uh, before reaching the age of 20, he read the Ihi Ulum al Deen um, 27 times. Uh, it's completely remarkable for somebody to have read the Ihi so much. So they held it in very high esteem. But it's very um, interesting interesting to see Imam Ghazali commenting on his own Ihya. <laughs> on reading it, you will see that with respect to its verification, conveyance, and comprehensive detail, nothing of its kind has been written. And we're covering the abridgment. Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah tabaraka wa ta'ala, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. He is continuing his discussion on scrupulousness, on ورع. And we saw him and made many examples of ورع in our dars yesterday. And this is of course born from his discussion on ensuring that you consume halal and staying away from eating haram. And uh, after understanding the harms that consuming haram has upon the body. That's one of the most harmful things to your spiritual state, to eat haram. So therefore always ensure that you eat halal. And we spoke about that. Um, in today's dars, he, um, everything must have a balance. So yesterday's dars, you know, after the class, I just remembered, I, I quoted uh, Imam Sha'arani from, is Mizan al-Kubra yesterday. I wasn't too sure what the title was. I said Mizan al-Amal. And that's a book of Imam Ghazali. Sha'arani's book is Mizan al-Kubra. Which is a masterpiece, as I stated, that bases fiqh, that lays fiqh out based on your level of, of wara, Your level of piety. Your level of scrupulousness. 
depending how strict you want to be on yourself. No. So, Imam Ghazali at the same time is saying you cannot become extreme. And an example of extremity that he, re that he mentioned was that the way of going to extremes with yourself and saying all the wealth of the world is unlawful. And the hands of people and their corrupt dealings have soiled it. Right? So now you don't partake in anything of the dunya. So how do you live? Right? Don't, don't reach such extremes. Um, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was sent into an Arabian Peninsula into the Jazeera Al-Arab, Makkah Al-Mukarramah and Medina al munawwara where the marketplaces were soiled like our marketplaces are soiled. There was also interest. Interest was very widespread. Therefore, Rasul so often spoke out against interest because it was the current state of the market. Among other evils that existed within the market, but Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not withdraw from society. He didn't spend his life in the cave of Hira and did not connect and call people to Allah, no. He dealt with the situations that he had within front of him. And he provided alternatives to a economic system that was soiled with haram and with interest and with cheating and so forth and so on. And that's an important thing to comprehend. So he gave us some guidelines, uh, which is really born from a fit discussion. Can I interact with somebody that has haram money? So he took people and he like really detailed them into six categories. And then also the position he adopted here is not necessarily the carried position within our fiqh. So can I engage or interact with somebody who has haram income, yes or no? And the rule is that as long as whatever business dealing I'm having with that person, I can assume that it comes from income that is halal, then it's permissible for me to do so. Even if I go to SA breweries, the Sadaqe, <laughs> like the worst example, because people in terms of the haram income that they have vary. Somebody, he may have some haram income that came into his wealth. Right? Any person that uh, has not switched over to an Islamic finance bank account may have some interest that comes into his wealth. And a good thought of our Muslim brothers that may have interest coming into their wealth they are getting rid of it. But whether they get rid of it or not, it means that their wealth has been tainted with some haram money. Can I eat from such a person? Can I do business with such a person? Yes, I can. No problem. Um, and on the topic, I shouldn't be having an interest bank account. With all the Islamic alternatives that we have on the market, it's not becoming of a Muslim to be have a bank account. That is a that is based on a on an interest bearing contract on a loan. So when I deposit money in my bank account, a normal conventional interest based bank account, whenever I deposit money, when my salary is the salary is deposited in my account, I'm lending money to the bank, and therefore the bank pays me interest because they come from an interest system. Whenever you lend somebody, you pay you pay interest. So I shouldn't be having such bank accounts. Right? I, I, I genuinely say this, right? I'm going to make an example now. But I don't know. I'm not referring to any specific person. But I know there were a few brothers when I had to make them payments. They would send me the Capitec banking details. Now, I don't know who it was. So if you did send me a Capitec banking details, I forgot who you are. <laughs> My point is that why do I have a Capitec account? And I'm not promoting any bank here. I'm promoting an Islamic alternative. And if I haven't shifted over to an Islamic alternative, I'm engaging in a haram contract. Even if I'm giving the interest away. Number one, I'm engaging in a haram contract. And number two, what am I doing? I am opening the wealth that I have with the bank for the bank to use whatever they want. If I have a hundred billion rands, I mean... <laughs> Only 100 billion. <laughs> and I place it with a bank. And it's based on the premise of a loan, an interest uh, contract between the bank and bank and I. 
then technically the bank have access to that money to do with that money what they want. The bank can invest in SA breweries, the bank can uh, invest in pornography, the bank can do what they want. Because I loan the money to them, they can do all the money whatever they want. One of the benefits of having an Islamic bank account is by virtue of your money, just one, one point alone, whatever money goes to the bank, the bank can only use my money for, for halal investments. So they would do home finance, Islamic home finance, and they would do Islamic vehicle finance, and so forth and so on. And on top of it, I can benefit, I can earn profit with the bank. That's not, a, my, my intention wasn't to get into that, but since we spoke about bank accounts, there's still a lot of Muslims that have not uh, detached themselves from, a, a, from problematic interest-bearing contracts. And they justify that by saying that, I'm not taking the interest, or I'm getting rid of the interest. Yeah. Your, your wealth technically is still tainted because some haram money has come into you. Can I do business with you? Of course I, I can do business with you. Know, because Ali also saying there's no problem with it. And as the amount of your haram income increases, or is tainted with haram, then um, he moves from one category to the next category. Of course, um, the worst is when the majority of your wealth is haram. Man kana akthar mali haram. Imam Ghazali said here, yeah, actually, which is strange because I know Imam Ghazali to say the opposite. He said that you shouldn't be doing business with such a person. But the ruling, as far as I know, within our fiqh, is that it's permissible to do business with such a person. And not haram. Now, Imam Suyuti speaks about the, under the qaida that jtama'a, al-halal wal-haram, ghalaba al-haram. It's almost as one of the... So the general rule is that when there's when there's a, uh, an overflow, when haram and halal comes together, the legal maxim says that um, the haram overpowers the halal. <laughs> it's almost like the haram overpowers the halal. The jtama'a, al-halal wal haram, ghalab al-haram. Examples of that would be, there's one verse in the Quran that creates the impression that you can be married to both your wife and a sister. And there's another verse in the Quran that clearly says, that you cannot be married to your wife and, and a sister. So there's an angle of halal and an angle of haram. We say haram gets precedence. Because it's haram for you to, to join between them. Um, another hadith, the Prophet said that um, you can take pleasure um, from a lady. Um, you can take pleasure from your wife that is experiencing menstruation. The area above her, above her trousers, ma al izar, and anything beneath her, uh, her, her trousers, which would technically mean now the yeah, the navel, the area between the navel and the knee, you cannot take pleasure from thee. But at the same time, the Prophet said, "Isna'u kull shay." If your wife is, has a height, do whatever you wish, illa nikah. You just can't have sexual relations. So now the area between the navel and the knee becomes shaded in one hadith, it's shaded as if it is haram. Another hadith shades it as if it is halal. So they say when it's covered with both halal and haram, ghalaba, al-haram. But the, one of the exceptions to that is somebody's wealth. If somebody has more haram money than what he has halal money, it's still permissible to deal with that person. Even though it's considered makru, it's still permissible. So if I come to SA breweries, and uh, what do they buy from me? Of course, I can't sell them something that's going to assist them in making alcohol. That will be haram, because I'm going to be assisting in haram. But let's say um, they, um, they're having a, um, an office event, and they want to buy some savories from me. So I sell them savories. Now they're going to pay me. Is most of the money haram? Yes, most of the money is haram. But SA Buris also has a tuck shop where they're selling drinks and chips and chocolates. Is it halal for them to sell drinks and chips and chocolate? Can I assume that the money they're paying me for the savories is coming from that halal income? If it's possible for me to assume that what they're paying me can be coming from halal money that they're earning, then it's permissible for me to interact with them, even though it's considered makru, since the bulk of their wealth is haram. Right? 
Uh, so these are some of the points that Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala made over here. Um, and everything, any, kullu shayin bi mizan. While at the same time, many of the Salaf, they would abstain from these situations. They would prefer not to engage. Um, we get asked a question a lot. Uh, uh, peop people say that um, I'm a carpenter and I need to build some shelving for a pick and pay and they're going to put liquor on the shelving. Can I or can I not? And we usually say that, um, you know, if if you've reached a point of darur or necessity, where if I don't take on this job, my family is going to go hungry, then <laughs> there's a different ruling for you. But the bottom line is, the more I'm able to practice wara and have cautiousness when it comes to my deen and my income, then that is something which is, which is preferred. So sometimes it can be a challenging line of, a challenging balance to, to uphold. Now, the best is that um, uh, when, I when I'm faced with such circumstances and situations that I consult with the ulama and I act upon their guidance. And I act upon their guidance. But wara is something that must continuously grow within me. And the more wara, the more I can practice caution without complicating the lives of others. And one of the, another very important thing that, that Imam Ghazali highlighted here, and I actually raised this when, before Imam Ghazali spoke about scrupulousness, I spoke about halal certifying organization. I think in two or three classes I spoke about the various halal certifying organization and how my wara or scrupulousness, irrespective of what level I may be on, should not lead me to be uh, thinking low of the ulama and thinking low of the scholars and becoming critical of the ulama, especially when my criticism is based on su'udhan, on ill thought. Especially when my criticism is based on ill thought. And uh, I made an example of how a group of brothers from Johannesburg was in Cape Town once and a lady from Anova Park made them a pot of food and they refused to eat because they doubted whether the chicken or the meat she used was halal. And the, the way that lady has been offended is more haram than the meat and the chicken in that food. Now, Ghazali mentioned that now. When your brother, Muslim, offers you something and you know that they are people of deen, you eat and you don't ask questions. Unless you have a real serious concern about the integrity of the person that you're serving. No. And that was the amal of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He made the example that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on a journey once with his Sahaba and they needed to make wudu and there was no water until they found a, a non-Muslim lady, a mushrika, an idolater. And she had, a, she had a, a satchel of water that was hanging on the side of a camel. And uh, she offered them to use from that water. And they didn't question the purity or the cleanliness of the water that they received from a mushrika. They just used it. And similarly, we learn within our fiqh and from the Prophet wasallam that even using the utensils of disbelievers are permissible. Unless I saw that they ate swine out of it, or drank alcohol out of a cup, then I must abstain. But if I did not see that, then the asr is that everything is pure. No. So the, the, your, your wara needs to be balanced with the guidelines of the sharia. Your scrupulousness needs to be balanced with the guidelines of the sharia. No. Especially when it relates to others, or when it comes to the feelings of others, or your dealings with others. And if you want to be extremely harsh in relation to yourself, then khalas, be extremely harsh in relation to yourself. Today people, we become harsh in relation to others, and I'm easier when it comes to myself. <coughs> right? The builder, when he builds for you, then he takes no shortcuts in causing you to spend a lot of money. <laughs> but when it comes to his own home, we take a lot of shortcuts. <laughs> so we tend to be harsh on others and easier on ourselves. Whereas the principle of the Sharia is be hard on yourself and, and easy on others. No. 
And then Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, I mentioned yesterday, was a amazing example of a person of scrupulousness. And uh, he once owed somebody money. So he went to the person's house to pay him his money back. And uh, outside at this person's front door, there was a tree. And it was a hot day. And Al-Imam Abu Hanifa was waiting for him to come out. So he stood in the sun and he did not take shade from the tree. So they said to him, Ya Imam, why are you standing in the sun? Why don't you take shade from the man's tree? So the Abu Hanifa responded, he said, I owe this man money. I took a loan from him. And the Prophet wasallam said, that kullu qardin, every loan that draws a benefit to you, jarra manfa'an, is riba. I owe him money, I don't want to take benefit from the shade of his tree, I may be guilty of taking riba. <laughs> Ajib. Ajib. Abu Hanifa was also a businessman. So he had a ship, well not, there was no shipment then, but he had a, a batch of clothing that he received. But they all had some defect. So he told his agent that was working for him, sell this clothing and whenever you sell a garment, make sure to make the person that is purchasing, make that person aware that there's some defect in the garment. So the person went ahead and sold the entire batch and made good money from it and then brought the money to Abu Hanifa. And then Abu Hanifa asked him that did you make people aware that they're buying clothing and has some defect? So he said, no, I forgot to do so. So Abu Hanifa took the full sum of money and gave it away in charity. No. Ajib. Yom Ghazali also spoke very harshly against the, the sultans, the rulers, the governors. And he saw them to be people that are very problematic and oppressive. No. Um, and Imam uh, Abdullah al-Haddad rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that Ibrahim ibn Adham was also one of the great pious people of the Salaf from the first few generations. He used to uh, work as a, he used to work in, uh, in a date, in a date farm. And uh, the owner of the farm came to him one day and said, um, can you just get me some sweet dates? that he wanted to eat. So Ibrahim Adam went, got him some dates, gave it to the owner, and all of them were bitter. So the farmer told him, you're working on my farm for so long, and you don't know how to distinguish between sweet dates and, and bitter dates. So he said that uh, since I've been working on your farm, I've never tasted a single day. Who said I can have? What are in the business place? How often do I take my work phone and make a phone call? That's not my phone, phone to use unless I got permission. There's a lot of things within a business environment that we take for granted. Even my time. Every time I sit on my phone, on social media, on Netflix, and all of these things are bad, I'm not saying you should do it, but I'm stealing from the boss's time. And I have understanding with my boss that every now and then I'm going to take a five minute break, no problem. But otherwise, how, how do I justify him paying me based on time and I use his time for my own benefit? <coughs> right? Ya Rab. Abdullah ibn Mubarak was one of the great scholars of the Salaf al-Salih. He was a very interesting person that used to split, spend, uh, split his year in three parts. One year he dedicated to knowledge, learning and teaching. One uh, third of the year he dedicated to, um, what was it, to jihad, fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one third he divided for Either divided to two or one third was for ibadah, not sure now. No, I think it was ilm and uh, business, sorry. So one third he did tijara, and he made enough money in four months to last him for the year. Once he made money that's going to last him for the year, why does he need to work for the rest of the year? 
So what he did was is the next four months he either dedicated to learning and teaching or the transmitting of hadith. And the last four months he used to spend in, the, in jihad, fighting in the way of Allah, ribat. And uh, they attributed a poem to him where he criticized one of the pious of his time, Fudail ibn Iyad. Even though Dr. Bhuti questioned the authenticity of this. They said it's not really the words of Ibn Mubarak. We allegedly said that Ya Abid al Haramaini, Lo Absartana, La Alimta Anna Kafil Ibada Tital Abu. I feel like narrating this now because I'm thinking of the Mujahidun in, in, uh, in Palestine and their sacrifices in fighting in the way of Allah. And uh, not to downplay our Ibadah. Because sometimes our ibadah can be more effective in granting victory to Muslims and actually fighting on the battlefield. But I narrated to show you how our ibadah has taken such a comfortable form and yet we are lazy. So he said to Fudail ibn Iyad, Oh, the worship of the two harams, if you were to witness us fighting on the battlefield, la alimta you would know that in the ibadah that you are making in Makkah and Medina, you're playing. <laughs> right? What did he say? Those words are tiring your horse walking around from masjid to masjid while our horses are waking up in the morning tired on account of fighting in the way of Allah. No, he said, uh, I used to know the old poem. He ended up saying, هذا كتاب الله ينتق بيننا. This is the book of Allah speaking between, between us. ليس الشهيد لا يكذب. The one that dies in the way of Allah is not dead. And the book of Allah does not lie. No. And the point really there is that um, we, Allah hasn't placed us on a battlefield. And had Allah placed us on the battlefield, what would our state have been? How would we have dealt with starvation? How would we have dealt with hunger? How would we have dealt with, how would we have dealt with? Because many people, they feel, I need to, I need to be there, I need to fight, but they say, they say your fight is to take your blanket off you in the morning to wake up with the hajjah. If you can't get that right, how are you going to pick up a weapon and fight on the battlefield? No. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should consider what we are doing to be any less effective in bringing Nusra to Muslims. These classes of knowledge, this i'tikaf, or tahajjud, I must believe that it has the equal amount of effectiveness, if not more effectiveness, in bringing Nusra to Muslims than any other jihad in the way of Allah, except that jihad is not something that is possible for us. La ilaha illallah. Allah grant us wara'ah. Al-Imam Al-Haddad, this is for our brother, that's brothers that like uh, Sufi stories. No. A lot of the brothers, they say it's so, it's so nice to be a Sufi. You can enjoy so many beautiful stories. And you can take lesson there from, and it touches your heart. And it increases your love for the Salihin and the, and the awliya and your aspiration to become like them. While other Masakin people, when they hear stories of the Sufiya, they get upset. And they mock and they laugh. And they take no benefit. Imam Haddad, rahimahullah ta'ala, he is... Uh, so from the, from the uh, Salaf, the Wara, the scrupulousness is that they didn't want any positions. They didn't want any positions that is connected to governments. And the most common position that were connected to governments is a position of qada. The position of being a qadi, a judge. So Imam Haddad, he visited his son. His son was Habib uh, Hassan bin Abdullah. He was in Abdullah bin, bin Alawi al-Haddad and his son's name was Hassan. And uh, his son's wife was there. And at the time she was pregnant. And she complained now to Imam Haddad, a father-in-law, 
about the difficulties of a of a pregnancy. So Imam Haddad, despite the difficulty, gave her glad tidings that you are carrying within you the Alim of Tareem, a great scholar. That was Ahmad, his name was Ahmad, eventually the name Ahmad, Ahmad bin Hassan bin Abdullah bin Alawi al-Haddad. So she said, if he's the Alim of Tareem, I fear that they may appoint him as the Qadi. So Imam Haddad said to her, لا تخاف, don't worry. I ask Allah not to let any one of my progeny become a Qadi. He won't be the Qadi. <laughs> and then Imam Haddad said that this grandson of mine will be the Ibn Hajar of his time. And he was a great faqih. You can question the story of Imam Haddad and his kashf of his grandson in the, wife, in the womb of his daughter-in-law. But what you cannot deny is that he said then became a reality. He wasn't a Qadi and he was one of the great, great, great ulama of the city of Tareem. Al-Habib Ahmad bin Hassan bin Abdullah bin Alab al-Haddad. And he lies buried close to Imam Haddad rahimahullah ta'ala. Ya Rab. Allah grant us wara. And there are many people I get in the community. Uh, one uncle, um, uh, not too long ago, was the thing when Uncle Ghulam told me that, um, he told me that uh, many years ago, he rented a shop with a business partner. And uh, eventually things didn't work out and they had to close business. And then uh, the month end came when the rental agreement came to an end. But the, uh, some stuff of the business remained in the store for another week or two. <coughs> and only two, two weeks later was he able to remove the stuff from the shop. But that, they never paid rent for the time that these things were in the shop. And he said that 10, 15 <laughs> years plus went by and this bothered him and bothered him and bothered him that he used another man's space for two weeks without paying anything. And then he planned on going for Hajj. And when he decided to go for Hajj, he said, how can I go for Hajj if this matter is unsettled with that person who shop I used for two months without his permission? So he had to go looking and looking and trying to find out where the owner. And then eventually um, he got the contact of his wife. And when he reached out to the wife, she said that her husband passed away a few years ago. And then he told her about uh, the shop and she said, yes, we still own the same shop. And he explained to her that I owe you rental. And she initially was, you know, is it then what you're speaking about the rental of 20 years ago? But he insisted and insisted and eventually even there, you know, I thought to myself, I would have done that until that point. And then I would have just hoped that they say, don't worry about it. <laughs> then I go on with my life. But no, he insisted and drove through and met the auntie. And uh, he even paid her more than what the rent was because in his mind, he said that the rent then was very little and the value of that is so much more today. And he gave her even more. And the lady, she cried because she was in such a difficult space at that time. And it says, Allah just sent him to bring her this money that she was able to benefit from. So you have people like that within society. But the important thing is that you and I must become like that. I shouldn't take anything that does not belong to me. Nothing. Um, uh, the story of Abdullah ibn Mubarak that I never narrated was that he was in Syria and he was a hadith student. So he's writing hadith, but he's in a class, he doesn't have a pen. So he uh, borrows a pen from someone in the class to write the hadith. So he's writing, writing, the hadith class ends, he forgets about the pen, the pen goes in his bag, and he travels all the way back home to Maru, Merva, in Khurasan. Right, thousand, thousand kilometers roughly away. And he gets home, he opens up his bag and he says, oh my goodness, I have the penny in my bag. 
and immediately he starts preparing to take the journey back to Syria to return the pen to the person who he took the pen from. Ajib, how many of us took a pen with us home from the masjid here in the during this rawah? I'm going to ask the khidma guys to niyat it for you, inshallah, so you won't be asked about it or questioned about it. Ya Rab. And then Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, he came to an end with that discussion, which all revolved around these topics. I don't feel the need to get into more detail over there. And what he stated was also very clear. He then moves on to the eighth principle, which speaks of upholding the rights, the hukuk of Muslims and good companionship, suhbah with them, which is very important. Fulfilling the rights of others and the importance of suhbah. Uh, and it's, this is a good topic because I know some brothers, they, some of the brothers here, they are called suhbah junkies. They only know what is, uh, they only know uh, what they call like liquor suhba. But companionship is not just about the, the good companionship. Uh, we have a tendency to, to connect to those who we are familiar with I and mean, we forget about everyone else. Suhba is about fulfilling the rights of everyone, even those who I don't get along with. As we will hear Fazali speaking about this in, in tomorrow's dars, inshallah. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. We continue to every uh, young woman who believes in Allah. We continue reading to every young woman who believes in Allah by Imam Muhammad Sa'id Ramadan al Buti. We are on page 50 uh, under the heading The Second Sufism. Bismillah. Al Bukhari has related from Sahel who said, When Abu Sayyid al Sa'id got married, he invited the Prophet وسلم, and his companions. No one made food for them or offered it to them apart from Umm Usaid. She moistened some dates in a stone vessel overnight. When the Prophet wasallam had finished from the food, she pounded some more until it was tender, took it to him and presented it to him. Those who desire for there to be no objection to the woman receiving her husband's friends as guests or her extended family and then serving them herself, entertaining them with a drink in her hand, sitting with him in order to amuse herself and chat, as is the case in many houses nowadays, in which the, sh the shade of virtue and the authority of the religion has receded, have also clung to this hadith. You know that what is reprehensible in the matter is not the woman's offering a cup of coffee to guests, rather what is reprehensible is her doing so while being adorned and uncovered, the issue is not what people are familiar with nowadays regarding offering a cup of coffee. Rather, the entire issue is her offering the cup of coffee while having an attractive appearance. All the jurists and scholars of the Muslims know that there is nothing wrong with a woman's offering food or drink to guests if she is covered in the proper Islamic way, whose bounds we have explained, and her husband or other male relative is present. This is how it was with the wife of Umm Usaid at his wedding party. In his commentary on the Hadith, Ibn Hajar says, It is obvious that in this situation, no temptation was feared and the obligatory covering was of being observed. It was not often the case when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, attended a gathering that the bride would honor the coming of Allah's Messenger and this take it upon herself to accommodate Allah's Messenger وسلم, and be hospitable towards him. And there is nothing in this dis in there is nothing in this to dishonor her, just as there is nothing in this that would attach any blemish to him. The real dishonor is in the one who clings to this hadith and finds that she uncovered her face and body in front of men and that she was beautified. This is something that cannot be found and there is no evidence for it in the hadith. Many of the female companions were present at battles, bandaging the wounded and giving water to the thirsty, and they included Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha. So who can say that this is therefore evidence that there is nothing wrong with a woman's mingling with men, 
however she pleases and beautifying herself in front of them however she wants? Many of the jurors have said that, it's, that it is permissible for the woman to be a judge in matters that she has the right to testify regarding and they have also said that she is allowed to be a mufti. So, who can claim, based on a faint trace of knowledge, that the woman can therefore be, quote-unquote, liberated from the shackles of veiling and covering, and that she can take her share in enjoying beautifying herself and her appearance in front of whomsoever she wants? The bride did it herself. She offered the drink to the Messenger of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the, therefore, the woman is allowed to display her beauty and charms in front of men. How is this different from someone who says, Allah has legislated trade with money and striving in the earth for the sake of provision. Therefore, it is permissible to engage in usury, fraud, and to deceive and swindle. How can someone know Islam and then not know that it gathered for humanity? every benefit when it legislated the way to attain it, unpolluted by any evil blemish, free from the motives of corruption and preserved by the warnings against deviation. Does the one bearing the sophism with the all-wise lawgiver to, uh, to make the woman some dirty thing that does not go in the street, does not solve problems and does not cooperate with a man in anything is this all he understands from Surah Nur, verse 31, and not display their adornments? Islam's most sublime distinction is that it deals with man's issues and circumstances in a way that guarantee, guarantees true benefit for his religion, his life, his intellect, his lineage and his property, and it has done so by legislating it and recommending it. It has removed him from anything that could lead to his suffering, evil or corruption, it has also done this without leaving any way for one to have influence over the other, and therefore it is possible to separate between the two, and it is facilitated for man to choose whichever of the two he wants. Where does the proponent of the sophism stand regarding this distinction? It is not a sophism that requires research, rather it is, as you can see, a hunter's trap that you only need to be cautious and wary of. Um, three pages. Three pages. Go to pass. So, um, Dr. Buti, rahimahullah tabaraka wa ta'ala, he is continue raising objections that feminists and modernists have raised in order to argue that a lady may uncover herself and she does not have to observe hijab and uh, he points out the falseness of the claim the the, the translation of uh, uh Mahdi Lock is interesting sophism a sophism is basically a clever but false argument that's exactly what we've been saying all along is when a when Baltil is draped with the fanciness of academia and journals and beautiful flowery language it doesn't matter how beautiful you make your language if what you're speaking is balti it remains balti but the human beings sometimes we are fooled by we are fooled by the way certain things are presented yesterday i spoke about the hadith of ummu waraqa in fact i believe that that paper of manata karan will be very beneficial um, for all of us to read because it gives you some insight into what Dr. Booty is conveying over and over here right his paper you'll find it online it's called the pretensions of the pretensions of postmodernism a study of the hadith of Ummu Waraka that's how these type of instances or happenings that existed within the sunnah how people are reading it and trying to justify the about it and we must again repeat that it's so contradictory that they are reading reports of the Prophet ﷺ from his sunnah to establish the batil while the reality is that they themselves reject his sunnah altogether. 
So they're using something that they rejected to establish um, something false that they are claiming. <laughs> right? How do you? And then you, 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 you sugarcoat that with academia and then you imagine you're doing something great. Ajib. May Allah preserve his sharia. May Allah use us to preserve the sharia. Here he's quoting a hadith of who? Imam Bukhari narrates from Sahal who said that when Abu Sayyid As-Sa'idi radiyallahu ta'ala an when he got married um, he invited the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions. When they came over to his home there was no one that made food other than his wife Ummu Usaid. And then he explains what food she made. And then she presented the food to her husband and to the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions. Nothing more than that. Now, if you have a sound understanding of deen, if you have a sound understanding of deen, and if the clear verses of the Qur'an and the clear hadith of the sunnah established an understanding within you with regards to the conduct of a lady and the way she carries herself and the obligation of hijab, etc. Once that correct sound understanding of deen exists within you and your heart and your mind, and you're free from any agenda. You're free from trying to achieve something, um, you know. The problem with an agenda is that you grab anything in your pathway to support your claim. But you don't have such a claim. You don't have that agenda. After you read the hadith of Ummu Sayyid, serving Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the companions, do you find any problem with it? Is there any issue with the hadith? Why should there be an issue? It's obvious that she served them without adorning herself, without putting makeup on, without uncovering her aura, without, without, without. What's wrong with that? That's normal. A lady, she prepares food or she prepares a meal, she prepares something to offer somebody that is coming to visit her, of husband, friend that came over while she maintains the correct and proper adab and conduct of a lady. In fact, our good thought of a sahabiya is that she's even more modest and conducts herself even better and covers herself better than what our own wives would do. But why does some modernists read the same hadith and then they deduct from the same hadith that you and I just read and found absolutely no issue with they read into the hadith, can you see she was uncovered and she was adorning herself and her aura was open and, and, and she served food to the... Where did you get that from? Like if you want to make an argument then at least bring, bring something. Like the hadith of Umu Warakah that we spoke about yesterday when we know she had a male mu'adhin and the Prophet ﷺ told her that she should lead the people of her house. There was still some semblance of an argument there. Because did the male, did the Prophet include the male in the people of the house when the Prophet said that she must lead the people of the house? So to us it's clear the Prophet did not include the male. But there's some ambiguity. So there the modernists can still raise some ambiguity. It's possible that the male was included when the Prophet told Umu Waraka to lead the people of the house. Here there's absolutely nothing. I just said she served. I mean, tomorrow, what are you going to say? Tomorrow a sahabi purchased something in the market and we're going to say that she was, um, she was, that she was modeling. Like, where, where does it end? Your ridiculousness. All to prove a point. So now, you turn to take away. What do you think, um, what do you think Abu Usaid would have done? If he knew what you're saying about his wife. You want to take away from the honor of this great Sahabiya who served Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and some of the companions. Why? To establish that the lady can uncover herself and she can mingle with strange men and she can do what she wishes. <laughs> is, is that what your level of, of academia has reached? Is that the level of your intelligence? Is that the type of arguments that you want to break Bring to break down Allah's clear verses in the Quran. Right? 
I feel sometimes, you know, bring, bring, bring a better argument. And then we can talk. But now you come with nothing. And you sugarcoat it with Baltin. And you expect now that we... That, that argument doesn't even deserve what Dr. Bhuti to respond to. And therefore Dr. Bhuti actually said, he said at the beginning of this book, he said when this paper was issued where they were encouraging women folk to get rid of their hijab and rid of the covering their aura and their modesty and so forth and so on, he said that it had the reverse effect because women folk became more attached to their deen when this person published that book. But I can see now why. Because that person who ever wrote this, his argument was so weak that any lady would have discarded what he had to say and attached herself to, to what was more clear within the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Rasul. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he has a, another few sophisms. Tomorrow he'll be touching on another one. Where is it now? We read number two today. There will be a third and there will be a fourth that will cover over the next day or two, inshallah. And hopefully they're going to have a stronger argument to say that the lady can uncover herself. But in my heart, in my heart, you and I, we must believe with conviction. And this is, this is what I leave you with today. This is what I leave you with today. You in your heart must believe that when the great ulama of this ummah reached consensus, and conclusion on matters of our deen, right? That you can never find a position that's going to be better than this. You can never. It's impossible that 14 uh, generations of ulama and salihin could have misinterpreted the Quran and the Sunnah. It's impossible for a man or a lady today to come and discover something within the Sunnah that a lady can uncover herself that was hidden for of the hundreds of thousands of ulama over the centuries. Impossible. And that's also a lesson for us that once our ulama has reached conclusions and discussions, whether it's in fiqh or in our deen in a general sense, then who are you and I to differ with him? Where is our ta'zeem of the ulama? One of the biggest problems we have in society is the lack of ta'zeem for the scholars. If I say Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala said something and I still feel that who's Imam Nawawi and why can't I have a different view or why can't I then where's your ta'zeem of Imam Nawawi? Or Imam Subki? Or Imam Azarkashi? Or Hafid al-Iraqi? Ahmad and Abdul Rahim? Who are you and I compared to these great giants? And therefore when these great giants all develop views and opinions, then how can I ever imagine that I'm going to discover something that they didn't know? How is it possible? Do you know what the extent of the ilm was? Do you know what their knowledge was like? Taqiyuddin Asubki, he has a son. His son's whole life is dedicated to ilm. 100% ilm. His son reaches about 18 years of age. Right? They say he needs to get married. He goes to his brother. His brother marries of his daughter to Imam Subki's son. Imam Subki's father, uh, this is not Tajuddin's father, Takiyuddin, and his brother, they go to the wife. They tell her that Tajuddin's whole life is knowledge, deen. Don't trouble him with the dunya. If you need anything of this dunya, whatever ever you need of this dunya, Come to me, his father will go to your father, we'll sort you out. Don't trouble Tajuddin, because his life is for Deen. And then she still troubled him with something of the dunya. And then he missed a class to go do something of the dunya. So her father and his father came to him and told him, leave your wife, divorce her. A man that gave his whole life to ilm, I'm not going to say what happened further, but his whole life to ilm. Right? They have wrote volumes of books. Their knowledge of grammar and nahu and mantiq, logic and aqidah and fiqh is beyond what you and I can comprehend. We won't even be able to memorize the names of the books that they authored. And every book that they authored was a masterpiece. 
So after the lives been dedicated to Deen, you and I come along, and what do we say? Um, who is uh, Imam Subki? What does Imam Subki know? I didn't saw a hadith on Google. Yani, so you and I, we need to feel within our hearts ta'zeem of the ulama, of the scholars. So even that day when I do adopt a position that is contrary to this, it will only be because I'm adopting a view of another great scholar. <laughs> right? Not because I, I know anything. Man ana, who am I? And what do I know? And what's the extent of my knowledge? Yeah. And if we have that type of ta'adim for scholars, we won't, we won't find space for, for ignoramuses to come along and try to change our deen and change Allah's law and delete ahkam. And, no, we, we, won't, we, won't also, we won't also show kindness to that. We won't show kindness. Bismillah. ربنا انفعنا بما علمتنا رب علم الذي ينفعنا ربي فقهنا وفقه أهلنا وقرابت لنا في ديننا مع أهل البتر أنثى وذكر ربي وفقنا وأصبهم لما ترتضي قولا وفعلا كرما وارزق الكل حلالا دائما وأخلا أتقيا أعلما نحظى بالخير ونكفى كل شر ربنا واصلح لنا كل شؤون وأقر بالرضا منك العيون واقض عنا ربنا كل الديون قبل أن تأتينا رسل المنور واغفر استر أنت أكرم من ستر وصلاة الله تغشى المصطفى من إلى الحق دعانا والوفاء في كتاب فيه للناس شفاء وعلى الآل الكرام الشرفاء وعلى الصحب المصابيح الغرر اللهم اهدنا بهداك واجعلنا ممن يسارع في رضاك ولا تولينا وليا سواك ولا تجعلنا ممن خالف أمرك وعصاك وحسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم يا ربنا اعترفنا بأننا اقترفنا وأننا أسرفنا على لما أشرفنا فاتب علينا توبة توسل كل حوبة واستر لنا العورات وآمن الروعات واغفر لوالدينا ربي ومولدينا والأهل والإخوان وسائر الخلان وكل ذي ما حبا أو جيرات أو صحبا والمسلمين أجمع آمين ربي اسمع فاضلا وجودا منا لا باكتساب منا بالمصطفى الرسول نحظى بكل سول بالمصطفى الرسول نحظى بكل سول بالمصطفى الرسول نحظى بكل سول صلى وسلم ربي عليه عاد الحب وآله وصحبي عداد طش الصحب والحمد لله في البدء والتناي سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين في كل لحظة بدا عدد خلقي ورضا نفسي وزينة عرشي ومداد كلمات نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر الله 
نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار نشهد أن لا إله نستغفر الله نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى اله وصحبه الفاتحة سبحان ربك رب العالمين والسلام على محمد الحمد لله رب العالمين أشهد أن